Carol Chen is a software engineer from uh, Jola and community chief uh, and responsible for the global communicating strategy in our three there. Mattia Nellis from uh, Iversity. Is Mattia with us? Or, um, yes, hello. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear us, Mattia? Yeah? Okay, yeah. and uh, Tomak is too bit from uh, the research assistant at Castle Plateau Institute and the, the Internet Technologies and System Group. Shirley Williams, a professor of learning technologies at the University of Reading. Oliver Von Berger, a professor of computer science at the University of Augsburg in Germany. Um, so quite a few of you have been involved in MOOCs in one way or another. Some of you have never been involved in a MOOC. Uh, that's the vote so far, so at least everybody can hear and a few people have problems viewing us. Uh, now that we've um, introduced ourselves, maybe we'll run a quick poll uh, to get a sense of our audience. So that's um, your, your chance to introduce yourself back. So are you running that poll? Now? And uh, yeah, so just say whether you're, you know, you see, you can also choose multiple, multiple categories. Just sort of, we get an idea of, of uh, who's with us today. Okay. Uh, so the structure of this, um, the, the the webinar today, um, the welcome is. Well, we're pretty much through the welcome. Um, I won't to, to take too much time myself, and and just as we get after we get the results from that second poll, uh, we'll switch to um, the other presenters, and each one will give a sort of a short statement on what they see as a potential of moves to enhance employability, what they see as the barriers. So we'll have a quick round of, of comments from uh, the presenters. And after that, we'll open up for uh, questions and answers from the audience. So essentially, most of the session will be really based on the questions that you, the participants, uh, bring in. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll, and, can you throw the results back up again? Sorry. Yeah, just quickly uh, show the results. Uh, so, well, we have you know, a good mix of students, recent graduates, developers, I think yeah, pretty much um, well, quite a lot of others, so I guess we missed all the categories, but um, overall a good mix of, of people from all of these sectors. Um, so uh, I'd like to now turn over to you, Michelle, uh, for, for your uh, statement on, uh, as I said, um, what is the potential of MOOCs to enhance employability and what do you see as the drawbacks? Ruth, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? I can't hear you. I hear you. Yes, okay, good. So, uh, well, thank you for, for the introduction. Um, Actually, um, in two or three minutes, uh, I'm going to describe a couple of uh, one experiment that uh, we have been doing at, uh, at Google. Uh, before I do this, we um, we are active in MOOCs with a tool that we launched two years ago. The name of the tool is Course Builder. It's an open source software, and we have been pursuing three goals with this uh, with this tool. Um, this tool is allowing to build MOOCs uh, in, a, in a very simple way. Uh, and the three goals that we have been pursuing are uh, development of our own internal MOOCs for uh, our engineers and professionals, MOOCs on uh, computer science, new tools, new techniques, uh, uh, also uh, so-called soft skills. And we have been using this a lot internally. The second goal has been to uh, uh, actually uh, release MOOCs, develop and release MOOCs for our users. So we, uh, we have released MOOCs uh, such as Power Searching with Google, Mapping with Google, Making Sense of Data, uh, Google Analytics, etc. Uh, more than 10 in total, uh, for a grand total of about half a million of uh, users. And um, this, uh, 
this has been to actually help people to better use uh, search or maps or uh, or other uh, other tools. Um, and then, uh, as a third goal, we have been pursuing some experiments with uh, external partners on uh, on, on MOOCs, on uh, massive online open courseware. Um, so these experiments uh, that I would like to report in one or two minutes uh, is really was re has been really aimed at employability. Uh, has happened uh, in Spain. And the partners uh, are a set of universities uh, with, with uh, uh, some leadership from the University of Alicante. Um, but there are other universities as well, Santander, Murcia, etc. So, uh, end of 2012, the University of Alicante launched uh, UniMOOC, which, uh, which is a MOOC for uh, young entrepreneurs, for young people which didn't have the, uh, which don't have the, the opportunity to attend university courses, but would like to uh, uh, to to launch their own business. And this MOOC from uh, UniMOOC, based on our tool Course Builder, has been uh, very successful. They had more than 35,000 peop people completing the MOOC. So based on, on this, uh, this first success, we actually launched a collaboration with this team of universities and, uh, and launched a pro in Madrid, from Google Madrid, the program called Activate, which is uh, a set of digital marketing courses. And these marketing courses uh, are covering several things. Uh, we started with e-commerce and uh, the use of large amounts of data, so-called big data. And um, so far, the, the course has been uh, uh, the, the course has been pretty uh, pretty successful with more than eighty thousand uh, students. Um, their certifications, more than twelve percent of them, obtain a certification, which uh, was through thirteen exams. And uh, they uh, they some many cases they they use these certificates. In in, uh, in LinkedIn or other uh, social networking tools for uh, for um, related job uh, search, and uh, so this is uh, for us a very encouraging first experiment, and we are still learning from it, obviously, but uh, it's uh, it's something that we have really uh, enjoyed doing, and which shows that for us uh, the, the there was something there. Uh, to, to be pursued and which could be useful for, to, to, to people wishing to, to get a degree online or, or to get some certification online and then use it for uh, getting a job or, or, or getting access to, uh, to the job market. Thank you, Michel. That, that's really interesting. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if you can also type, you know, the, first of all, the some Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, to yes. Yes, so we'll, while we're, I'll pass on to Doug in a minute, uh, and while he speaks, maybe you can uh, just note in the chat uh, the details of, of the tools you mentioned and that specific MOOC that you said that uh, people are using as, as a reference in their LinkedIn profiles and so on. Um, yeah, people are asking about the detail, the names of the project and so on. So uh, if you can throw that into the chat window. Um, next, uh, please, uh, Doug, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry you had some technical issues with Flash. And uh, if you can then, you know, quickly in a, in a few minutes uh, respond to this question of, you know, what do you think from your perspective is the potential of MOOCs? And, um, and what are the barriers for them in terms of employability? But before that, just one good thing. I remember somebody asked, what's a MOOC? And of course, we need to acknowledge that not all the world knows what a MOOC is. So uh, maybe you can start by, um, uh, by saying, you know, w what is a MOOC? And then say w where, where you stand on this front. OK? Over to you, Doug. OK, thanks very much, Yashir. Am I coming through loud and clear? Can you hear me OK? Can you hear me OK? Yeah, we hear you. We're here OK, and we see your presentation. OK. So, uh, over to you. 
Okay? Okay, uh, well, we seem to have lost that, so quick improvisation, and we'll switch over to uh, Thomas. Hope you can uh, uh, pick up the banner, and, oh, is Doug back? No, sorry. Okay, Thomas, so over to you, if you can uh, quickly give a one-line definition of what is a MOOC, and tell us um, where you see uh, MOOCs contributing to employability, where you see the barriers. Okay. Hi. <coughs> Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, yeah, what is MOOC? A, a MOOC is, a, the, the definition is a uh, massive open online course, so it's a, it has a, um, kind of the, these four uh, components. It's, it's massive. That means it has a lot of participants. It's open, free for everybody to use, uh, without barriers in, in, in terms of uh, money or um, previous um, um, kinds of um, um, yeah, school, um, whatever um, prerequisites, and um, it's online. And it, the, the basic of it is a, is a course, so it, it offers um, knowledge to um, or yeah, to to um, everybody who has um, internet connection and is able to, um, oh, or is interested in a, in a topic. That would be my definition of a MOOC. And um, so um, I'm from OpenHPI. OpenHPI is the, the MOOC offer of the Hasselblattner Institute. The Hasselblattner Institute is a, um, is a, um, um, Kind of a public-private uh, joint venture in uh, in Germany in Brandenburg, in Potsdam, and um, it is uh, part of the University of Potsdam, and it's um, um, partly privately founded by the uh, Hasselblattner Foundation. And <coughs> um, we have a couple of offers that bring our um, con or that, that want to get our our um, Knowledge outside of the of the walls of this institute. So uh, we've been uh, working quite long with the tool called Teletask, which offered um, just the the filmed um, um, lectures in 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 our uh, offline courses online. And uh, in 2012, we started uh, with uh, OpenHPI and. Um, OpenHPI is, as I said, our MOOC offering, and um, um, it's it's a classical um, classical so-called X MOOC. So um, um, yeah, and um, so what or what we are. Uh, did just recently. Um, so we're not we're not one of the big providers of MOOCs. We're we're a rather small one because we only offer our own courses that we also are offering um, offline in the on 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 campus. And we have um, focused on IT related topics because that's uh, the the thing that we're offering here offline as well. And we have courses in uh, German, in English, and we just started to offer courses in Chinese, which are served on a, on a um, separate platform, which is uh, also located in, in, and hosted in China. And um, so here you can see a couple of these topics that we've been covering uh, until now. So these are all co uh, courses that are offered also on, offline at our uh, university. And um, Oops, content is missing. Okay, uh, so what we um, what we did recently was uh, we, we did a, a user survey with our um, or within our user base. We have about uh, fifty thousand registered users in OpenHPI, and um, what they um, we asked them how they see the certificates, how they see our um, yeah the, the certificates we are offering. 
And uh, we ask them, for example, if they think they are too easy to, to achieve or if they want to have them or a little more difficult. So at, at the moment, it takes you, you have to get 50% of all the, um, all the points that you can achieve um, within the course to get a certificate. And as you can see, quite a couple of our users are thinking that's too easy. So half, about half, half. And um, um, this was a very interesting question because we asked, so how should we work on the verifiability of the, of the, of the certificates? Because uh, at the moment we don't know who, who's doing actually the, the, um, the test. So um, we have somebody who is um, the registered user, but who's the one like um, clicking the, the, um, the boxes? We don't know. So could anybody and quite a lot of people said we, we're not interested in the certificate anyway because we have a job already so that may be a, um, uh, a little bit special for, for our offering because um, that was uh, something we found out as well we when we started we were thinking that we will or we, we are offering the courses to, to students mainly but uh, in the end, we found out most of our participants are professionals that are, have about five to ten years uh, professional experience in their, in their job, and they just want to keep on track with new developments and so on. And um, um, one thing we just recently added to our, our certificates is a, um, a way to, to check if somebody manip manipulated on it. We still can check who did it, um, but um, now at least we can check that nobody kind of photoshopped it or, or whatever. And um, so we also asked if people would like it, be interested in, in like more, um, more um, verifiable uh, certificates and if they would like to do Brockett exam and if they would be willing to pay for it also and like very few people um, did that. But, and uh, that turns the thing uh, quite a bit around when we ask, would you, would you add a mood certificate to your job application? Most of the people said, yeah, sure, I would do that. I would do it, would do it uh, like in that low, um, verifiable way that they are at the moment, you can, um, I would just add them. I would even add a um, confirmation of participation, which is kind of um, n telling not very much about your, about your um, actual um, proceedings in, in the, or, or your, your progress in the course. They would even add that because they think that um, these kinds of, kinds of certificates um, add a valuable um, incentive to the to the to a, to a job application, and um, so what we are doing now is uh, we are running a similar survey for employers, and we want to ask them how do you see that? How do you um, think? How or what's your opinion on the on the on the value of of these certificates without um, verifiability all that, and all these uh, issues that they have? And we would like to invite all of you to yeah, take part in this survey. If you're an employer, um, take part yourself. If you're employed, ask your uh, human resources um, department to, um, yeah, to take part. And that's what I have to say for now. And you also prepared a survey for us to run down at uh, in the session, right? So we'll, we'll throw that poll up now and see uh, what, what the people here think. Yeah, okay. So what would be your priorities for you as a MOOC participant to attach a MOOC certificate to a job application, right? If you're, yeah, especially you know, the people who are reporting themselves as students, recent graduates or, or um, developers, uh, would you consider adding uh, a MOOC certificate in a job application under which conditions? So, uh, we'll give this a bit of time. Yeah. 
and yes, uh, and uh, Dad, uh, I'm glad you have your meds to make it back. So uh, while we're asking for, you know, while we're waiting for people to vote, I think we'll flip to your presentation. Uh, okay, well, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, so thanks, hear me. Thomas, for that. I think that was very, very uh, interesting and, and sort of very, very important data for us to consider. Uh, do we have the results from the poll? Yeah, so we'll, throw the, we'll have the results from the poll. Of course, anyone who has any questions to any of the speakers. So we seem to, to confirm um, what you are showing in your, from your study, right? So that's, uh, it, uh, I think there's a good match here. Uh, it's very interesting stuff. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions to any of the speakers, just throw them into the chat and, and we'll bring them up after everybody finishes their presentations. Uh, quickly move on to Doug uh, and thank you. Okay, can you hear me okay, Sean? Yeah, we hear you well. Thanks. Excellent, good. Um, well, first of all, apologies for connection issues. Um, that was caused by two things. Firstly, I don't usually have flash installed on my machines, um, which Spreed um, needs. And secondly, my neighbor decided to run a concrete mixer this morning, um, and I work from home. So apologies about that. I had to scramble to find somewhere to um, connect. Um, it does bring up an interesting issue, though, doesn't it, about people's access to MOOCs and like whether they have a fast enough connection to do some of the things, some of the tasks that's required on MOOCs, whether they have the stability of the connection, whether they have somewhere to work from. As you can see, I'm currently sitting in front of a chest of drawers. This is my little safe space to be able to connect to you today. You know, do people have a calm, safe space in which they can they can study? And, and these are ongoing issues, even in a digital environment. So my name is Doug Belcher. I'm the Web Literacy Lead for the nonprofit Mozilla Foundation. You probably know us best through Firefox, uh, but we're actually a global nonprofit, uh, and we focus on keeping the web open and free and kind of non-commoditized. I'm on Twitter as DJ Belshaw, um, and I always respond to emails, Doug at MozillaFoundation.org. Okay. Um, so I think the reason, the main reason I was um, asked to participate in this webinar is because Mozilla incubated something called Open Badges. Now, if you haven't seen this, I encourage you to go to OpenBadges.org and have a look. This has now been actually um, spun out of Mozilla um, as a separate nonprofit um, called the Badge Alliance. And this is a new website as of last week, badgealliance.org. Um, and let me just explain what open badges are, because I think that they go together with MOOCs, as Americans would say, like peanut butter and jelly. So um, this is how open badges work in practice. You can imagine um, um, an open badge as being a bit like the kind of badge you'd get from scouts or swimming, the kind of things that you sew onto your uniform or onto, onto your trousers, like I used to when I was younger. So my son, who's seven, he's in Beavers, he gets a badge for doing a specific bit of work, um, and he sews it on to show that he's managed to achieve that particular thing. And I think with badges, that's a, a similar kind of thing, but on the web. Um, and this is an open ecosystem that anybody can issue a badge for absolutely anything else. But because it's using um, metadata, and I'll explain what that is in a moment, it means that this all works together all over the web. So anywhere where the web works, open badges work. So if someone is issued a badge, they earn the badge, it goes in their badge backpack, they can display it, just like we saw um, when we were talking about MOOC completion certificates. You can take that badge, be it for um, participating halfway through the MOOC, the entire MOOC, um, you know, really engaging with distinction, whatever it is. And you can um, display that badge anywhere on the web. So, um, you know, eventually on a LinkedIn profile, Facebook, Twitter, WordPress, your own blog, a wiki, I put some of my blog sidebar, that kind of thing. Um, and then the idea is that just like with the web skills MOOCs, you know, unlocking new possibilities, lifelong learning, um, and job opportunities as well. Um, but the other tool, which I don't think many people have seen, you might have seen Open Badges, but we've got a, a brand new tool which kind of came out of the Open Badges work funded by the, the Gates Foundation. Um, and that's called Mozilla Discover. And this is very much um, an, still in its early stages, but this is the thing building upon Open Badges and credentialing um, and things like nano degrees that have come out recently. Um, I think this is the thing which I really want to focus on in this webinar, which is learning pathways. Because I think that we don't scaffold the, the, the learning arc um, well enough at the moment, especially in, in digital spaces. So this is just at discover.openbadges.org, and we're going to be using this um, throughout kind of the Mozilla ecosystem to scaffold um, contribution um, and level of people in terms of their learning around web literacy. 
So let's just take an example. This is a real person, Robert, who's a software engineer at Mozilla. We've done this in healthcare um, in, in technical kind of things. Um, and there's one other one as well, I've forgotten. But basically what you can do is, and this is a very early kind of prototype, um, you can drag and drop different things that you've done. The learner's always in control. And you can drag and drop different things to show that a pathway, either that you want to complete, or you can take another pathway that someone has said that they've done, and you can pledge for it. So you can see this person has done like hard skills, like um, around Python and, and that kind of thing, but also softer skills. So curious cat, you know, really um, uh, like feeding their curiosity around things. There's another one for working well with other people. So kind of softer skills. Um, and you can see how those pathways aren't usually just a straight line, but sometimes they meander and, and change as well. So I think that's a really important thing to capture and something which we'll be working on much more. So this is an example of the kind of badge you can get. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that not everything needs to be a credential and not everything needs to be a badge. Sometimes it can be telling a story. So there's, there's um, scope for story bits in here, which basically give you the context and the backstory for what it is that's going on. Um, and I think that while we've got places like LinkedIn, like people's profiles, like um, the CV and the resume, wrapping context around there is something that we don't do well enough. So being able to scaffold that learner journey, either by people pledging for it and saying, this is something that I'd like to do, or retrospectively doing, saying that this is something I have already done, um, is of value, especially when it comes to employment. So I'm just going to kind of park that there. Um, Yishai, before I dropped, asked me to define MOOCs. I think somebody already defined it. Um, but having kind of followed people who are very much imbued in the connectivist learning um, landscape, Canadian educators like George Seaman, Stephen Downs, Dave Cormier, um, I, I really do hope for a return to much more of a, a community-focused um, massive open online course structure. Um, we've tried to do that with, with Mozilla. We have a, a webmaker training area. I didn't put a slide in there, but um, if you search for webmaker training, we're trying to do that on an ongoing basis, not having kind of MOOCs that have a start and end date, but having an ongoing kind of um, community feel to leveling up things around a, a kind of a loose course structure. Um, so th that's perhaps something we can explore as well. But I'll stop there because I know that we're over time already. Um, and so apologies for my, um, my later Bible. Thank you. And I think you know, connecting uh, what Thomas said about people uh, reporting that you know, the, the, their achievements and moves are something they do want to count, uh, but also sort of having different levels of achievement, whether you've completed part of the MOOC, the whole MOOC, or put in that extra effort, combined with the, the badging infrastructure that the Mozilla are developing that allows me to actually record and verify that. Um, you know, there's a thing to pick up here which is you know, this offline kind of very sort of rigorous verification and whether that ties in with Mozilla badges, but uh, again, yeah, we'll maybe keep that for later. Uh, Shirley, would you like to go next and, and give, you know, all these things seem to kind of pose a challenge for the kind of more traditional uh, academic world, or is it an opportunity? Um, and so if, if you'd like to kind of uh, give your, your uh, views at this point. Okay, thanks, Yushe. I, I take it you can hear me? Well? Yeah, yes, okay, great. Okay, um, yeah, so more traditional academic institution. University of Reading is a partner in FutureLearn. Uh, we're offering a wide portfolio of courses aimed both at uh, people pre-undergraduates but also at um, continuing professional development so people in work looking to enhance their skills. We've just had a couple of definitions of MOOC and let me add to it mine because I, I think I disagree with Doug. So massive I think means more than thousands. I don't think it means tens or hundreds open, open to anyone who can access the internet, no charge. But you may run courses which recommend that you know something else. So this course is aimed at people who are already working as managers in some role in an organization. Other people can come and take it, but it's aimed at those people. Uh, 
online, I think we, we're certain we know. But of course, I think that one of the strengths of MOOCs is that the community go through the course together. I, I think leaving courses open afterwards is a good thing. People can catch up. But I, I think having the ability to be working through materials with other people is an important part of MOOCs. So I think that's something perhaps we can discuss later to know whether we're talking about the same sort of animals. Okay, um, at Reading, the, as I say, we, we've run different types of courses. Uh, we've run them with tens of thousands of people. We haven't got into the hundreds of thousands of people for one course yet, but that is potential. Uh, I think the big challenge is accreditation. I think the quality people who are here at our university see it as something that they're very, very nervous about. Uh, there are things, uh, Coursera have the signature track, but ultimately you only know that it's the same person taking the assessment who took the course. You don't know that it's the person whose name it is you're putting on to that certificate. And I think that will always remain something that makes traditional universities nervous. We, we like to know that we're giving the degree certificate, which we would traditionally would have a graduation, to the same person who came and sat in the classes and sat in the exams. But I think this idea of completion, participation in a MOOC, evidencing what you have done, is something that's very important and I think that is where there is growth. Um, I was surprised that there were a few people in answer to the earlier poll who didn't want to say I've done a MOOC. Uh, well, you might not want to say that you've done a MOOC in healthcare if you're applying to for a job in software engineering, but if you're doing software engineering then I think we would expect, we would like to see that you're continuing to take courses which are related to that particular discipline. We're currently running a course um, on managing people aimed at um, people who are already working as managers and I, I picked up yesterday one of the participants in response to something that was part of the course saying that he worked in a local council and that money is scarce, personal development of staff is a priority, but they always are trying to do it in-house because that's the cheap way of doing it. Uh, and he's saying that things like the Future Learn courses give so much more, and he can't understand why all local councils and all employers aren't saying to their staff, get out there, look at this free training. So. That's an employer saying he thinks these things are good. Um, and I guess that probably has covered all I want to say for now. So I think the bottom line of the emphasis is, and that seems to coincide with the vibe we're getting from Coursera and, and FutureLearn, that the trend is more towards continued professional development and less towards initial academic training. So you see the sort of the university and the MOOC uh, systems uh, working side by side. Okay, uh, EJ, can I just come back there? I, I didn't yes. mean to imply uh, it was just for continual professional development. I think that there is a role for undergrad, pre-undergraduates, mm -hmm. so people taking tasters of their course and in the UK using the fact that they have taken that as something that they put on their UCAS statement. So yeah. I think for uh, school children there is also potential for them to use it as evidence that they're a better person to get on to a degree course that's in demand. I think yes, and, and the DFP just published a report last week about the role of MOOCs in secondary education. So that's yeah. definitely another trend to follow. Um, I suggest we switch over to, uh, first of all, welcome Oliver, who's joined us a bit late, but we're glad to have him here. Um, and, uh, but we'll switch first to Matea. 
uh, represent diversity, so that would give us another perspective. Uh, hi, Mathia. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, well, we hear you well. It's Lovely. Good presentation, so we're good to go. Yeah, while the presentation is loading, uh, thanks for inviting us. We, uh, we, uh, oh, there it is. We uh, at Aversity, we are a MOOC platform, so um, uh, I hope that I can share some interesting insights with you. So my name is Mathieu Nellis. Um, I am an academic partnership manager at Aversity, and here on the slide you see what we do. We, we basically provide free education, and we try to make it count. And we're here to discuss uh, sort of the latter. How do we make it count? And um, how, how do we improve employability? But let me start off with um, you know, a brief insight um, on um, uh, diversity. The company was founded uh, in 2000, uh, or in earlier in 2011, but uh, we really focused on MOOCs only in 2013. So we are 25 people. We are a Berlin startup. We started uh, in October um, to, um, 2013 with 10 courses and, and about 115,000 users. And we currently have 35 courses and about half a million users. And the number of courses will rise to 100, and the number of users will rise to 1 million. So we are in the MOOC domain, um, the, the European, or the leader, uh, I'd say, one of the leaders in the MOOC sphere. So here you see you know, some of our partners um, on the university level or in the institutional level. Um, but um, the main difference to Coursera, for instance, is that we cooperate um, with practically everyone who, um, who is a researcher, who uh, comes from an academic institution, and who, uh, who does want to do a qualitative MOOC. So we do, do not only focus on uh, research brands. Um, let me then ki kick off the debate with describing very briefly the status quo. Um, as we all know, there is um, um, a growing uh, or the trend of growing costs in higher education in general. Um, and secondly, there is a globally seen a um, growing demand for education and, and training. And at the same time, you know, there's an extremely fragmented online courseware market. So, and um, this is where MOOCs kicked in. They have been around, you know, since 2008, but they really kicked in in 2012. And since uh, uh, then, the, um, they have delivered free education with uh, moderate to no formal recognition when they started. And um, here, I just want to share three brief points with you, you know, um, because there are numerous barriers. Um, um, Shirley has mentioned one, but I want to share three others with you. So um, what are the barriers of recognition? Um, I mean, first, there's the lack of knowledge about the content providers and courses. Third, or second, um, there's the lack of transparency regarding institutional procedures and uh, pedagogy and assessment. Um, and there's a lack of trust in institutional quality systems. So this is something very general for the online course market. Um, and now I want to share um, um, the three hypotheses with you. First, um, this is really what the, the study has uh, shown that um, was conducted by the EU. MOOCs can be crucial to develop um, you know, I IT skills, but also uh, different skills needed in the current labor market. But um, also, we believe that the future of MOOCs um, um, depend on the accreditation and recognition. Uh, and, and third, and this is uh, something that we might get into in the debate later, I think um, improving the official recognition of MOOCs um, requires a joint approach you know, by all stakeholders, not only the EU, um, but also you know, from bottom up. Um, we need a strong political support on a national as well as a Euro uh, European level. So now let me um, sort of conclude with diversity's approach. So as I stated, um, um, we strongly believe in the fact that MOOCs can deliver um, you know, academic knowledge, but also relevant um, skills, um, and also um, domain-specific skills, for instance, like um, HTML5, et cetera. So um, to improve the recognition and employability, we as diversity, uh, as a platform, as a MOOC platform, we focus on three things at the moment. Um, we provide certificates um, with uh, proctoring and verification solutions. I won't go into too many details at this point, but if you have questions about that, uh, you can always ask me. It's pretty much um, the, the standard um, online proctoring that Coursera also does. Um, second, we try to allow for more transparency. How do we do that? We um, really offer, um, for, the, for the paid certificates, we offer now what we call course supplements, sort of a, a document explaining um, 
you know, what the learnings um, and the learning outcomes of the course of the respective course have been. So this is something that we've, um, we're experimenting with the different um, types of certificates, but we've uh, sensed that this is something that really, uh, that's really urgent for the um, users. Lastly, and this is why I'm glad that Oliver has joined us, we're offering um, MOOCs um, for ECTS credits. Um, so this is very interesting, and we are focusing on that. We really try to get all our partners to offer ECTS credit MOOCs. And um, as of now, um, there's a technical, um, uh, well, people have to be present to conduct the exam. So this is uh, in the big catch. But um, um, we are thinking that in, in various directions, offering um, you know, um, and the exam at test centers, et cetera. And I'm glad that Oliver can speak a little bit about his case. And um, yeah, let me finish. Um, there is an ongoing debate in Europe about you know, how do we um, actually um, you know, improve recognition. There are numerous you know, um, frameworks out there and the EU has, um, t since 2013, I'd say, um, you know, I highlighted that in the um, right corner, focused on um, really improving the, the skills and qualification accreditation. There is, there's an ongoing um, debate about the framework. They, they are still conducting um, high-level um, talks and um, public consultations about that, but they're thinking on how to best develop that. And we, are, um, as a university, are following that um, very closely. And um, I want to now conclude and thank you for your um, you know, um, um, interest in um, uh, posing two open questions. Um, you know, what do employers, um, uh, oh, can you actually bring that back again? Sorry. What, you know, what do employers require to accept certificates? This is something that um, we are always, you know, we, we talk to employers, but we're still interested in hearing, you know, what do we have to do to, to, uh, to make um, the certificates for the users more valuable? So we are um, interested in hearing that. And lastly, um, you know, how do we create an efficient exchange between all the stakeholders? Because we know universities and MOOC providers and employers are some stakeholders, but not, not, not only the, um, are not all. So we need to get them together. And how do we best and most effectively do that? Get them together and, and work on the um, recognition aspect. That's something that we're preoccupied with. And I hope that the debate will touch on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll switch rapidly to Oliver. Uh, I think uh, there's a very good link because as you mentioned Oliver's MOOC is run on, on diversity and you mentioned that you worked together with them on the accreditation. Um, uh, so quickly Oliver and then finally Carol and then we'll open up for the questions from the audience. Uh, thank you Oliver. Over to you. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you well. And okay. Hear you. okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Oliver Vornberger from the University of Osnabrück. I'm teaching computer science and uh, in the last winter term I've produced uh, a MOOC Algorithmen und Datenstrukturen that was in German. So it's about algorithms and data structures and programming in Java. And this MOOC is being broadcasted right now uh, in the summer term on the platform Iversity. So uh, the MOOC consists of uh, 14 chapters. Um, oh, so there is no animation in, this <laughs> in the slides I gave you? Oh, well, that's too bad. Unfortunately, um, the animation doesn't pass through. Uh, so so that, uh, I, I uploaded a PowerPoint uh, file and several of the slides have animations, so I, I noticed that, <laughs> that all the animations can't be shown right now, so that's too bad. Okay, so the, the MOOC consists of 14 chapters, so each chapter is presented in one week, and uh, a chapter consists of several units, and each unit has several uh, video takes, and um, each video take may consist of either me talking in front of the camera, so speaking about the background, or I'm scribbling with a pencil on a tablet PC, uh, or I am, um, oh, that's really too bad. So that's the, the highlight of my <laughs> presentation. So no animation here. So it's uh, Java source code that is presented that is presented by PowerPoint in a typewriter modus so that it looks like the teacher is just typing. 
Okay, so you can't see this right now. Okay, at the same time, either if I'm uh, using the pen on the tablet or if I'm using the PowerPoint, there's a second camera that uh, makes a record um, from my hand and this hand is then combined with the capture of the uh, either PowerPoint or of my tablet so that the user can see uh, the content of the slide and at the same time can see my hand and my finger moving. Um, after a unit there is a multiple choice quiz so where the participants can use the diversity platform to answer uh, questions that are related to the uh, video content and each week there is homework and um, this homework is graded uh, through peer reviewing meaning that everybody who uploads a solution will get five solutions from his co-workers and he has to um, uh, comment on the solutions and he has to grade them. Okay, at the end of the course, uh, the oh, again, there is no animation. So at the end of the course, there is either a proctored online exam uh, where we get support by adversity that the students can answer. Oh, here it is that the students can answer uh, questions uh, and it is graded by software. And there is a, uh, a written exam uh, at the University of Osnabrück and that is graded by our students uh, who do the grading um, in the live uh, lecture and uh, what is important is uh, if the participant uh, passes uh, this exam he will get a grade, he will get a certificate with six uh, ECTS credits. So that's my five cents of advice. So um, we're, we're really shortly going to, to move over the questions from the, and we're already seeing some questions coming up from the audience. Uh, what we'll do is we'll switch uh, off, since Carol doesn't have a presentation, we'll switch to the chat window now so that while Carol uh, you know, gives us her perspective, um, the audience can already start throwing in their questions and then we'll, we'll try to answer those. So Carol, I mean you've heard all these presentations from people who are involved in, in producing or delivering MOOCs from different uh, perspectives or in accreditation, you know, whether it's through um, you know, ECTS or through uh, Mozilla badges and so on. Um, from a kind of, you know, you're, you're from a, a vibrant young uh, startup, the kind of thing that we think, you know, the kind of company that we hope will take you forward. Um, how does all this look like from your perspective? Do you think that this, this would be a contribution in terms of um, the, the sort of workforce you're looking at? Do you think this is something that you would count on seriously when you're interviewing employers uh, and so employees and so on? Hi, uh, can all of you hear me? Yes, we yep. hear. Okay, yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, so yes, uh, I'm Carol Chen and uh, just to kind of re reintroduce myself, I work in a company startup called Yola and uh, we are making smartphones. Uh, w many of us were formerly from Nokia and uh, from the Meagle project which is like uh, based on open source uh, components and so the, the, the operating system running on our new uh, smartphone is called Sailfish which is based on Migo and many open source components and um, I think there's actually some parallels that, that can be drawn from this MOOC and also open source community uh, working together it's a lot of learning through collaboration and, and, and the knowledge I mean sharing of the knowledge in, in a kind of open and community based um, I'm also a co-founder of a uh, non-profit organization here in Finland um, that promotes, uh, organizes and promotes uh, activities surrounding open source and um, open platforms. And uh, I, I think um, even though the, the 
this um, my company and organization is based in Finland. We have members, we have employees all around the world. I think something like 20 different nationalities across four continents. So you know the the sometimes when we um, find new people. Um, uh, a traditional degree, which is in, while important, sometimes may not tell us the full picture of what the person can offer, because you know different universities have different standards. We we are may, maybe unfamiliar with what's happening in Asia or Australia, and um, sometimes it's hard to compare or, or judge just based on uh, uh, something from a university. Um, however, what in the open source. Um, kind of projects, what's good is a lot of times you can share, you can demonstrate your contributions, for example, sharing your code on GitHub, Gitores, and um, many of these platforms. And people in the community who have worked with you can also verify that you know you, you are capable of doing this and um, you, you, you know these are like real real life projects that people have worked on and, and in a way I think if um, if MOOC can, um, I was just through these discussions, I was thinking if if we can somehow have some some courses that work together with real life projects and and really show, um, you know, because uh, I think even in a, in a normal courses, whether it's online or offline, that there's always this thing about how do you demonstrate uh, abilities through projects and, and, and verify that, that you can apply what you learn. So um, th there are many, not, not just, um, of course, uh, t technology, we're, we're talking a lot about technology here, but just, you know, projects in the community that, that can be worked on together and um, maybe applied to, to make, uh, you know, more, more something contribute to the to the MOOC to make it more verifiable that hey this is you know something something that's concrete and substantial and tangible maybe that has been produced through uh, working and learning together so um, yeah I, I'm actually very happy to to I think I'm more of a, a Learn, learner here rather than a, a speaker because I have been, you know, uh, quite interested in this subject myself. Even though I've been traditionally educated uh, in a brick and mortar university in Texas uh, almost two decades ago, but um, this this has been, I think, this is the where where things are going from this point forward. Um, people are all mostly online and uh, from different parts of the world. They shouldn't be that much limitations about where and how you want to learn, but really what you want to learn and how to make that happen together. I, I think that's a very interesting point you raise about, you know, learning in, in open source communities, um, because that brings in two elements that um, I think are, are quite weak in, in a lot of the moves we see around today. One is the sort of the open-ended, project-based uh, practice-based learning, and in the survey we ran, um, and, and it's on the website, um, it, a lot of the participants in MOOC said, well, what they really miss there is something that's more practice-based, more project-based, and obviously, I think, and it'll be interesting to hear from, well, from Matea and also from um, Thomas about how they think you know these kind of things can be incorporated into MOOC platforms. Um, the other question is also the, the issue of, of community dynamics. And again, Doug mentioned uh, the sort of the original MOOC vision from from Canada, which was very strong. You know, the, the slogan of the community is the curriculum. So again, uh, much less structured sequential curriculum and more community driven like you see in open source communities. Uh, the other thing is you know the connection is sort of we're seeing a kind of a blurring and continuing continuum between um, you know, very informal, unstructured learning experience into university uh, structured experience, and both Shirley and Oliver commented on that. And uh, there were some questions about, um, you know, the relate again, so sort of maybe adding more detail about relationships between uh, MOOCs, ECTS, EQF. Um, and, and uh, university degrees and so on. Uh, so 
why don't we now uh, perhaps, you know, well, if, if any of the speakers wants to comment on any of these issues that I mentioned, then we'll start it from there, and then we'll start going through some of the questions systematically. Matea, yeah? Right. If, yeah, right, right, if I may. Um, there have been some questions uh, regarding the ECTS and, um, you know, certificates. How do you, how do we do that? Um, you know, is, is that even allowed? And um, is that a sort of a trend for f uh, future MOOCs? Um, I mean, in Europe especially. Um, in, in America, we've seen quite a few um, four-credit MOOCs um, coming now, and some institutions, very few, in America accept that. In Europe, we have an advantage of, you know, we have the Bologna process and. In theory, if you are able to obtain ECTS credits, then it's um, as a student, right? And we're now speaking of students. It's easy for you as a student to get them recognized at your home institution. I mean, there are some conditions related to that. I mean, they have to match sort of your curriculum in a way. Um, um, but yeah, so how diversity as MOOC provider, we don't um, hand out ECTS. That's important to know. We are the platform pro provider, and um, people like um, Oliver and the universities who we partner with, they offer MOOCs as part of their accredited degrees and through that they're allowed to um, offer ECTS credits for their exams or for their um, MOOCs so um, and like I mentioned very briefly in the intro um, there is a big catch related to that yet because you have to be present physically present at this stage um, at the end of the MOOC to take the exam and this is sort of what the German um, law requires, um, because otherwise um, you're w the techni um, we're not quite sure that the person who actually registered for the course um, really does the exam at the end. So we, we don't we can't overcome that problem. So we make them come to r um, to write an exam. But and this is very but like but any yeah, just to clarify. Yeah. So the the requirements for people to be physically present is derived from the German law. Right, it might be different in other countries. If other countries allow you to complete a university degree with online exams, then you can do that. Right, right. Um, there have been examples. Like it depends on national law. Um, I'm, I won't go into the technical uh, technical details here. I mean, there's some some people who believe that um, handing out ECTS credits for online courses in Germany is, is fine as well. But the um, universities have so far been. Um, reluctant to hand out um, ECTS credits for online, um, um, you know, online courses because um, you, you have you're facing this big problem. You you have a group of thousands of people who can potentially be awarded with ECTS credits. So you narrow it down and um, you you have a more controlled environment in, a, in an exam atmosphere at the end. So I think um, uh, the future holds a potential for that to um, for that to be overcome. So that students actually have to be present physically physically present at one point. Uh, I'm not going to um, bother you with the details, but the, the first step is, for instance, to um, make, um, to offer sort of what TOEFL does, TOEFL does um, offer the students the possibility to go to any test center in any country, in any city. So this is sort of the se uh, second step. Or um, in, in second option is um, that it's not even required anymore because we have technical possibilities to, to really measure uh, to really make sure that the, that, that the student is the right one, like keystroke and online proctoring, etc. So that's that's on that. Uh, Thomas, you wanted to also comment on this question. Well, actually, I would like to to comment on uh, on the uh, project project based learning and the the other. Um, yeah, learning activities that you mentioned earlier, and also on Shirley's comment in the in the beginning, uh, where she said that the community is a very important uh, factor in a in a MOOC, and that's for us as well. I I um, didn't mention it in the beginning, but our MOOCs are always uh, based on a, on a in in a, in a certain time frame, so that the people are really working together in this time. So they are working on the on the materials for one week. During this one week, and then they they they, they switch on to the next week, and we really try to to keep them focused on 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 this uh, topic, so that they are working together as a as a community and discuss the things on the on the uh, discussion boards and, and all that stuff. Um, concerning the the more uh, practical um, or project based uh, approaches in in learning, we are. Currently, are working on the uh, on that, and we're, we're currently implementing uh, additional features um, such as uh, 
um, practical programming exercises, for example, and uh, practical um, um, security um, tests and, and, and stuff like that. As yeah, so as they are fitting fitting to to the courses that we are offering. And um, we are also are working on, on group work feature, features, for example, so that uh, students can, um, within these big um, courses, within this, this massive amount of users, that they can form smaller groups and, and work together in a more private atmosphere. Currently, we're doing this uh, only on a, on a, a volu voluntary basis, but we, are also, uh, we have also run some, uh, some uh, pilots with, uh, where they really got kind of a group group work assignments and stuff like that, just to to address these uh, two points. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shirley. Maybe you want to also say a bit about the you know the practices of learning in, in your MOOCs in terms of you know of project work of collaborative work. If you see any parallels with. Uh, the kind of uh, open source community dynamics that, that Carol mentioned earlier. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I, I was thinking as we were talking there, uh, I, I'm a very big fan of the group going through together where possible. Um, I think you have to make allowances that there will always be reasons people slip behind. But, but for me, the really important thing is that it's uh, lockstep. Uh, when we talk about project work, I, I perhaps should mention a project that we did with the World Association of Girl Guides and S Girl Scouts, which is an umbrella organization for uh, national guiding bodies around the world. And they have some very fantastic training that they run for potential national leaders but it's very very expensive because traditionally they fly girls in girls young women into centers in one of four or five six places around the world and they have to fly trainers in and, and it becomes prohibitively expensive but one of the things that they really did like with the doing project work and we did find that with careful stewarding and help, it's possible to get that project work of people working together. I'm not convinced that if we go for a true connectionist approach of leaving people to find each other, it would have worked in that international context of people with different languages it needed, um, I think, nurturing. So I think getting good project work, project work with teams is possible, but I don't think that it can work in all situations unless you have somebody who's there, who's able to steer people around, get them towards working together well. So I'm a big fan of lockstep and I'm a big fan of making sure that there is some support so you don't end up with what happened to me. The first uh, major online course I took, which must have been 15 years ago, we, we were all uh, put into groups as we arrived. And like a lot of online courses, a lot of people dropped out. Uh, and I found myself in a group by myself, which wasn't the best way of doing group work. So I don't know whether that was what you wanted me to answer, but it's an answer. Well, no, it, it's an interesting answer. I think it's, it's a very good answer, actually, because it just shows us that, you know, we, we are in, in early days of this whole MOOC phenomena, but actually there's a, a very long history of online teaching and learning. Um, so a lot of the problems we're already, we should be aware of, um, and, and we should try to learn both from you know, uh, formal online courses and informal communities such as open source communities. And there were a couple of questions on, on badges. So maybe we'll switch to you, Doug. Um, there were, uh, one question about 
uh, badges that are acquired very easily and so um, you know if you have a university degree or if you have even if you get you know six ECTS for, for a MOOC, there is a way of, of quantifying that achievement for good and for bad. Uh, how do you quantify uh, badges? How do you aggregate badges to something that, that has um, uh, a kind of a, a, a greater value? Maybe the, the Discover project that you mentioned um, is, uh, is something in that direction. The other question was about uh, badges badges and privacy issues. I'm not sure exactly what the details there are, but can you see any privacy issues with badges and, and are there ways that you're dealing with those? Yeah, um, I think I got most of those and I think you put in the, in the back channel the two questions um, uh, that were mentioned before. So let me just say two things. Firstly, um, I'm not on the Open Badges team anymore because this has been taken outside of Mozilla. So if you want the absolute latest up-to-date information, then join one of the working groups, which is at badgealliance.org. Um, but what I do know, and I'm still quite closely connected to that team, is that um, the learner is always in control of um, an Open Badge. So when, an it, when a badge is issued to you and you decide to put it in your badge backpack, it is by default private. So nobody else can see it apart from you and when you're logged in. You can choose then to share it um, either as a collection of badges or as a single badge and you can choose to put that and embed that wherever you decide to, to put it. Um, the important thing about open badges and I could spend a lot of time talking about it as I have done over the last couple of years is that um, the value of open badges comes through either the name of the organization or the individual who's issued the badge if that's a well-known organization um, or through kind of the value of the metadata. So metadata is data about data. It's the kind of, you know, when you go to the library and you see the Dewey Decimal System, it's data which is added to something to, to make sense of the landscape. So with an open badge, when you click on it, it has metadata literally embedded inside it, inside the image. Um, and those things include um, who issued it. Um, it includes the criteria, evidence, those kinds of things. So it's one of those situations where even if you've just like when you get someone's CV or resume, if you've never heard of the organization or the um, institution or whatever it is, um, often we take this on trust, whereas with an open badge, you can click through and see the evidence. If someone's got a, a badge for public speaking, for example, you can click through and potentially see the evidence of that, that person doing that in practice. Um, in fact, there was a wonderful example of someone using open badges in Canada um, for immigrants coming over from Asia whose language skills weren't necessarily fantastic, but were showing their skills through open badges, um, linking directly to the evidence of them doing electronic engineering. So there's, there's huge value, I think, for showing what you know through badges, not just somebody stamping it and saying, yes, this person has done a proctor exam, but actually seeing in practice what this person can add to your company and what this person can add to your team or, or organization. So I hope that answers those two questions. I'm happy to answer any more you've got, although I could spend a long not time talking about badges. Okay, so there were some questions, and you know, well, there was a question that was actually targeted at uh, employers. Although we don't have a lot of uh, a lot of speakers from uh, you know, commercial companies, we have Carol, and unfortunately, uh, Michelle had to leave. But uh, quite, but maybe other people could also comment on that. Do you see scenarios where someone would get? employed on the basis of, of MOOC achievements and other informal achievements uh, even if they don't have a degree. So I assume that if, if you need uh, you know, um, a cryptographic um, programmer or somebody to do a sort of very complex signal processing, you'd want someone with a, a good university degree, but maybe for other positions you would take someone who can demonstrate their skills in, in some other way. Uh, Carol, I see nothing, so I'll let you go yeah. first. Yeah, I'll comment a, a little bit on this. And in our company, uh, we do hire people based more on what they have done for uh, the related open source projects and um, more so than any kind of degree. We do have people w without so-called traditional degrees. Or even myself as an example, I do have a, m a master's in computer science and I was a software engineer in Nokia 
But in Yola, I'm actually doing more uh, community development. I'm organizing develop developer events. I'm I'm doing social media. So it's it's you know marketing and communications and uh, all these coming together. So it's it's not. I don't have a degree in this. But because I have been doing this already while I was in Nokia, something similar, and people are aware that uh, I have this um, other side besides the uh, engineering side. So of, of course, if you know the people, they, they can they, they know what what you can do. But if if not, how how do you represent this uh, skills and knowledge in a form? And I think that's where maybe MOOC can come in and um, kind of uh, give credit to certain things that you do outside of a traditional degree. And Shirley, do you want to also comment on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been involved in um, employment at all levels within the university. And um, you asked the question whether people would get employed on the evidence of MOOCs. And I would say, like all informal education, I wouldn't employ someone on the evidence of this, but I would use it to make a decision to interview someone. And then if in the interview they showed real evidence of understanding what they were claiming, then they would be eligible to be employed. So I, I think the question is wrong to say, would, we, would anyone employ just on the evidence of MOOCs? The answer has got to be no. Um, many employers that I, I have worked with um, are a little bit reluctant to employ just on the evidence of degrees. They want to run their own recruitment processes. They want to run their own tests. They want to run um, employment these days, certainly for students in sort of engineering discipline, takes a long time. And I think that employers will look at evidence of MOOCs, but they will want to test it out themselves. OK, that was what I wanted to say. Well, that, that's, of course, a very important point. We have to, uh, and you're right, of course, nobody employs you just on the basis of your CV, whether it has a degree or, or a badge or a MOOC evidence. Uh, but uh, being able to demonstrate that you've acquired some skills, that you've, uh, that you've had some valuable learning experiences is something that contributes to at least getting to that interview. Um, now, uh, what was it? Um, sorry. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so there, there was a question about, um, you know, all, all, all this issue of accreditation, proctored exams, uh, sit-in exams, and so on, uh, that, that sort of starting to breach the boundaries between MOOCs and former university uh, um, education seems to rely on having some accepted standards, right? And you mentioned that Iversity and Coursera support proctored exams, but we don't know about other MOOC platforms such as MiradX, Fun, FutureLearn. On the other hand, there's you know questions about you know um, mobile learning and 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 then di different pedagogies and so on. So I wonder if, if uh, well, first of all, Mattia, but also other speakers can comment on if, if you're seeing some sort of convergence to certain standards in the MOOC scene, both in terms of modes of delivery and in terms of modes of accreditation. Right. So first of all, the great thing about MOOCs or online, any online courses, is that the, you know you can always go and see the quality of the lecture yourself. And so um, it's there is a huge degree of transparency uh, in MOOCs or an inherent degree of transparency in MOOCs in general because they're always you know repeatedly offered so the employers could really check out the MOOC in theory. But now relating um, or regarding the you know quality standards is something that we are really concerned of at our university. But the great thing is, if you cooperate with academic institutions, such as the University of Osnabrück um, or any uni university in Europe, you have the guarantee, um, I mean the formal uh, guarantee, that they produce um, academic content um, uh, under, you know, required, um, with required um, 
quality um, assurances. I mean, there, there are numerous quality assurance mechanisms in academia, and I think Oliver can talk about this um, uh, much more detail than I can do. But it's easy to cooperate with, uh, cooperate with already accredited uh, academic partner institutions. And the quality that we have, uh, the, the question that we have is, how do we go about it if, you know, um, if we cooperate in theory with uh, companies who offer skills? Because there are yet no, um, you know, quality standards um, for um, for training and um, 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 skills um, learned through through MOOCs. Um, I mean, ECTS is one point, but the the, uh, the skills and the um, the reference framework for that is another one. And the EU, like I've mentioned in the introduction, is working on a framework. But um, uh, we don't know yet how it, uh, how it will be and how it will be accepted. So this is an open question. You also you mentioned that your conversation with the universities and with employers, I also tried to coordinate some standards with other group providers. I mean, other platforms. Right. Um, Informally, yes, uh, but there is no um, official uh, stakeholder dialogue yet. But um, of course, we're interested uh, in hearing how other uh, how the MOOC providers, you know, offer you know their um, certificates. And for most of the um, um, European providers, the, the whole topic is relatively new. So, um, like you've mentioned, I, I don't know too much about Sun. I know I know Miriada and the, uh, some other smaller platform providers. So there is informal dialogue going on, but no official, you know, stakeholder dialogue to, to really guarantee um, the same quality standards. This is something maybe for the, you know, um, for the future that we'll uh, look into. Uh, yes, yeah, Thomas. Yeah, um, we are actually currently also um, investigating this topic. So we are um, kind of um, evaluating what are the, 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 the basic similarities between the different providers and um, so um, what, what we want to do in the, in the near future is kind of proposing a, a sort of a micro standard and we would definitely like to invite you, especially you at Iversity because we are basically neighbors, um, to <laughs> um, maybe um, Join us in these in these efforts and, and maybe talk about this and uh, maybe start it informally and, and uh, just see see uh, where we can get it. Okay, so so we've actually managed to kick something off with this uh, event. That's great. Um, we are I'm, I'm aware of time. We'll have to wrap up shortly. So just want to say that uh, the, in case anybody is wondering, this session has been recorded, is being recorded. We will also post a blog uh, item with a summary of the main points that came up and the names of the projects and the links and you know not just from the speakers but I also see in the chat window that some of the participants have contributed some interesting pointers so we'll obviously include those in the blog post and finally we'll have a space for online discussion so if you if your question hasn't been addressed or if you, you know five minutes from now suddenly realize you forgot the most important question to ask then we'll continue the discussion online i hope that the uh, the speakers will also join us in that online discussion over the next few days because I think it's, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, just sort of, uh, to kind of close the session, I'd like to quickly go through uh, all five, uh, all six of our speakers now and ask you to, you know, in one or two minutes say what you think are the hot trends to follow in terms of, you know, what's coming up next and what you see are the big open questions that we still need to address. So uh, let's just go, um, you know, start from uh, Doug and um, then Thomas, Oliver, Shirley, Carol and Matteo. So Doug, over to you. Yeah, no problem. I'm just dropping into the chat what I'm going to say um, for the benefit of people whose English is a second language. Um, so developments on the horizon. Um, I'd love us to drop the term MOOC. It's really awful and clunky and unwieldy. I'd love it if someone came up with a better term um, because I've seen, for example, people talk about open MOOCs when open is in the ac acronym anyway. It's, it's what I would call unproductively ambiguous as a term. Um, another thing, 
I would say an open question is the extent to which industry and private providers are going to drive innovation in this area um, and to the extent at which kind of slower moving institutions, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, things moving slower, um, like universities, like the tension between things moving fast and things moving slower but potentially more rigorously um, and I think FutureLearn um, is promising moves there. Um, and I've already put this in the chat, but I, I really do predict more talent spotting through MOOCs. You know, there's, there's people who are in far-flung places who, who are likely to, to join MOOCs because they've got IQs of like 170, 180, whatever, but they just haven't got access to education. Um, and they can be talent spotted, um, like plucked out their situation, developed, whatever. Um, and so I see talent spotting as being um, a huge thing. And I put a link to a service that, that does that, not necessarily with MOOC providers at the moment. Um, and that brings up the, the idea of how we're going to fund MOOCs. At the moment, it's kind of investor story time. You know, I'm going to provide everything for free, um, and there's no real understanding of where the money's going to come from. Um, so I can see increased data mining of learners um, and, and that being sold off, uh, a bit like the Fitbit that I'm wearing tracks number of steps um, and that can potentially be sold off to insurers. I can see the same thing happening with learner data through MOOCs and there might be a backlash there. Um, so I see the future as being bright for MOOCs in the sense that you know there's, there's lots and lots of opportunity but um, I think that the MOOC providers are going to have to be careful about backlash in terms of mining learner data. So um, Thank you. Tom, see you next. Okay, yeah, well, um, I think that uh, kind of the, the um, this informal style of, of MOOC certificates that we have now will be more and more um, at least extended with the other forms of more formal um, certificate um, styles like with the Brockdot exams and also with the ECTS and all, and all that stuff. I think that that is something that's coming now. I also think that it's something that we have to be um, probably careful about because it, it takes some of the of the easiness of the of the move that we have now. So if um, yeah, you know, you just uh, join it and then you get the certificate and it's it's kind of a, a fun thing. And, and the more formal it gets, the the well, the more fun it loses. Kind of. Uh, <laughs> it has to, and um, I think we have to to find a, a kind of a good balance in in these things. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Oliver, over to you. So, what do you see as the sort of the hot trend to follow? What do you see as the big unanswered question that we still need to figure out? Well, I see, I see um, two big problems. Uh, the one problem is that uh, we have to install some kind of uh, quality system when we offer MOOCs because right now there is a huge variety uh, that starts with uh, people just sitting in front of the camera and, and talking about what they comes to their mind. Uh, and then ranging uh, up to a uh, university course that uh, ends with uh, uh, ECTS credits. So that's a huge bandwidth and I think that it is difficult to uh, keep this broad range. Uh, I think we have to define some kind of standard. The second problem I see is that the production of a, of a good MOOC is much more complicated and takes more time than most people think. So uh, we all have high expectations uh, through our TV and uh, movie experience, so we expect a, um, a rather uh, uh, nice uh, presentation when we uh, enroll in a MOOC and I think that uh, that is uh, much too uh, it, it, it is a lot of work for the people who produce uh, the MOOC and I don't see how and uh, who actually can afford this. It actually ties in the question of quality with the question of the business models that uh, Thomas and, and Doug have also commented on. Uh, Shirley, over to you. Uh, again, what do you see as the exciting trends and what do you see as the big challenges? I, I think maybe 
both challenges. I, I agree with uh, Doug about the acronym. Uh, I use it, I, I talk about MOOCs. I think the massive is scary to learners and I think it makes my bosses ask me for big numbers. And so I, I think that perhaps the free courses and the fact that something that's free attracts a, a large number might be a better description for what we're talking about. The, the other thing that's in my mind, and we haven't really talked about it very much, is that the courses that exist are attracting graduates, they're not attracting necessarily the people who they're aimed for. Uh, I've heard the term leisure learners used elsewhere and I think if we look at the courses that we run occasionally I look through uh, a set of posts on one course and I'll recognize a name and there's, there's somebody there who's registered on a lot of Reading courses, a lot of Future Learn courses and they're obviously there for general interest. They're, they're probably like me, they've got this silver colour hair, uh, but they may not be working. I think that we're attracting a lot of learners like that, and I think it's great that there's facilities for them which have replaced a lot of things that we've lost in the UK of night classes and the like. But I think we've got to make sure that we also mm. attract the audience who we design the courses for. So if we're doing a course that's aimed at CPD, we've got to be sure that we're actually attracting the people, the people who it's aimed at are able to come for, for that course. If we're doing something on basic skills, are we actually reaching the young people that we want to learn these skills? So I think the big challenge for MOOCs is the name and making sure we're attracting the people that we're aiming our courses at. Oh, and dealing with the others who come, because why shouldn't we? Dealing with what? We, we, we've got to deal with the people. So if we design a course which is to teach, um, I don't know, basic programming skills uh, to people who are going to go on to careers as web developers, if we also pick up people who are mature and uh, already have programming skills but thought they might be quite interested in things to do with web development. They're not our main target audience and so we should be serving them well but we really got to make sure we get that target audience. I'm counting on my fingers and my fingers aren't actually um, visible as I count. So it, it's been aware of the diverse audience. Thank you. Um, uh, and Karen, over over to you again as an observer. You said you, you see yourself more as, more as an, a curious audience and an expert, but uh, I think that's a valuable voice for us as well. So, from what you've heard today, what do you see as as a promise and the challenge going forward? Uh, I think there's definitely a lot of promise in in MOOCs and. Uh, you know, like uh, I, I see myself, if I want to uh, learn something new and fur further my my knowledge, to to enroll in MOOC uh, courses or MOOCs, and um, I I think the, the the idea that you can be in any part of the world, any remote part, and still be able to participate in a MOOC is is pretty uh, powerful, and uh, you know, like we, we would be willing also, for example, to hire someone with that skill set from a different part of the world, not, not just because they have a traditional uh, uh, kind of, um, what do you call that, education from a traditional college, but also demonstrated through either an online course or online participation. So there's, def there's a lot of potential there and in both learning and in um, being em employable by different companies. Uh, Definitely, the challenges already some mentioned. You know, like having the the is is probably is is not a trivial thing to set up a a, a good MOOC course, and uh, you you need probably you know good uh, connection, internet connection, and and having the the actual technology in place to to dis distribute to such a wide audience, and also um, really I think 
not just MOOCs, but also um, traditional courses uh, in in face-to-face -face courses. There's always this question about how do you um, make sure how how do you guarantee that what what this person learned um, can can be verified somehow. So I, I think um, that's probably an ongoing question, whether for MOOCs or, or in general education. So thank you. So uh, it's interesting to see the connection with what the previous speaker said. And finally, uh, Matea, uh, your view on the hot trades and promises and challenges. Right. Uh, I have the honor of concluding. Um, well, many of the challenges have been addressed. And um, let me try, you know, try to speak from a platform or provider perspective. Um, um, First of all, we as a platform try to provide um, education to as many people as possible so, um, and with as much fun as possible. So we do offer certification, but it's definitely not, not mandatory. Um, and we, what we want to do um, is also to make learning more social and more enjoyable. So we are working on fe features such as group work features and um, in more interactive features like chats. And this is something for the, you know, um, longer term, but we, our aim is to make um, the, the learning experience as enjoyable as possible. And um, I also want to say that um, uh, the, the user of the data mining is something that we have felt is really is a big concern of, of European academia. And this is why we totally refrain from selling any data at all. So this is something really important, like intellectual and the user data is something that um, you know, um, belongs to the users and the in, in, in instructors. So that's at the heart of um, our understanding of you know how we how we do MOOCs. And lastly, to to maybe to address two challenges. I mean, Oliver has has said that um, doing a MOOC is a is an expensive endeavor and it's very time consuming. And I see the challenge that um, that instructors. Um, don't get as much funding and as much time off from their university, from their employer, as they would need to do a great MOOC. Um, and um, so the, the, the funding and the time issue is, is important, and lastly, the quality. I mean, we have the cooperating um, mostly only academic institute. There is a great degree of um, quality already, but MOOCs no quality um, whatsoever. So mean you can do a guitar MOOC or you can do a storytelling MOOC. You can do any MOOC. Um, and the, the question is, do do they have the uh, academic quality? Do we need an um, um, academic quality for MOOCs? I believe some cognition framework is why I enjoy talking today. Is it really? I, I got the sense that um, the, the, there is the real thinking about how do we get the recognition of MOOC? How do how can we improve that? And this is a topic that we'll be working on, and uh, we'll be um, talking to some of the participants here in the webinar. So it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. If in fact, we were part of the research collective to get funded, but one of the main items there was setting a st quality standards for MOOC. Um, but I'll just want to iterate some of the points that were repeated by some of the speakers here so that you know, business models for MOOC and the chat on some of the ads and all of us said that he did that MOOC would seem to take a lot of effort from him in his own shared time using the university recording studio but I assume that that was in times when it wasn't re needed by other other rounds of commercial and, um, uh, initiatives so there is an issue here in terms of the business model, obviously the academics to produce high quality materials at certain times is not a sustainable model. Having university invest uh, you know, tens of thousands of euro in the MOOC without seeing a clear return on that investment again is not a sustainable model. Um, and and that, so that's something that definitely you know, needs to be addressed. Likewise, a question of, of quality of MOOCs, and I think you know you said you work, uh, Mattel, you work with academic institutions. Uh, I don't think that guarantees quality. The thing is that if you go into a classroom and you get a bad teaching experience, nobody knows. But it's online that it's you know, it's just out in the open, everyone can see. So in a way, you know, on a sort of on the other side, MOOCs actually be a driver. Of
higher quality education, even in formal education. But what we definitely raise the question of quality, and now we need to address that. Um, data, big data, um, no, ever since MOOCs, well, not, not ever since MOOCs started the Canadian version, but you know, if you look at that, the callers first, a TED talk, they talk about big data and, and the potential of big data and uh, as we know with great power comes great responsibility, right? So, uh, so that issue of, of big data again is, is creeping, uh, coming up as a very uh, hot topic in education, both in practice, in research, and policy. Um, we've been to an event recently with you know, Javier Monetzat talking about the risks of, of data, talking about the risk of people being kind of put in a, in a sort of minority report situation where your future is predetermined by what the data says about you. Um, and finally, the issue of, of broadening participation and actually getting to the right uh, target audience. And uh, as Shirley noted, we still see that most MOOC participants are actually people which, who, who already have a degree, which is not uh, surprising because MOOCs are essentially a form of self-regulated learning. If you haven't been through formal education, you probably don't have the skills for uh, self-regulate. I mean, not probably, but you know, there's a risk, especially the kind of you know the audiences that we're talking about more in the periphery, more in the sort of economically disadvantaged disadvantaged parts of Europe. People don't necessarily have those self-study skills, and maybe we need to think about how we support that. So that's you know, that's another issue that we need to track as as kind of a big research question. Uh, finally, not so much research, but something that that came up uh, just through the chat that a lot of people are asking sort of very basic questions about uh, what is a MOOC and what what are all these things we're talking about. You know, us you know, we're already sort of quite familiar, we've been working in this area for a couple of years, we seem to assume that everybody knows what a MOOC is, but just go down to your local grocer and ask them if they've done a MOOC and you know, get a response there. So there's definitely some work to be done in terms of awareness here, and, and of course in terms of, of getting the technology that would uh, support the right um, that is a rich type of learning experiences in the scales that we're talking about. So again, I'll just you know, quickly flip to the uh, to my presentation uh, where just so we have um, all the the, you know, the speakers together on one slide. Some of you have already had to leave, but again, I want to add uh, to thank. Doug Bashel, Shirley Williams, Matea Nels, Professor Oliver Wonberger, Thomas Tablitz, Carol Chen, Michael, Michel Bernard, uh, for joining us today in what has been, for me at least, a very interesting and, and surprising session. And um, looking forward to seeing you all online. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Shay, for um, sharing it so well.